take a moment and think back to your earliest memory or one of your earliest memories. Just go with whatever pops into your head first. Where are you? Who's with you? What's happening? How do you feel? And then ask yourself, how does this memory fit into the larger patterns of your life? In other words, does this memory reflect the rule, or is it an exception to the rule? Whenever I do an exercise like this, I think back to a time I must have been three or four years old, and I'm arriving at my grandmother's house. And I've just walked through the front door, and I'm walking through this little hallway, and the kitchen is on the left. And uh, my grandmother's kitchen was, it was a small kitchen, and it had this, uh, it wasn't a wall, uh, it was sort of like half a wall <laughs> uh, that, was, that divided the kitchen from the hallway and the living room, but the top part of the wall was made of these wooden posts so you could see through it. And I know I'm little because I'm looking up through these posts, and my grandmother is standing in the kitchen, Mama, as I called her, and she's got this big smile on her face. And there are all the smells that waft out of her kitchen are there. And she's happy to see me, and I'm happy to see her. And it's a wonderful memory because I, I feel loved in that moment. And a lot of my early memories are like that. But then in middle school, high school, the, the scene changes. And my memories from that period of my life are a lot more isolated. A lot of time spent by myself in my room, listening to music or just being alone with my thoughts either by myself or with a couple friends. I'm shy, I'm withdrawn. I didn't feel very good about myself. And I didn't know who I was or what I wanted to do with myself or with my life or anything, really. But then as I go a little further, when I hit college, the scene shifts again. The gospel enters the picture. And... There's new life, there's new love, there's new learning and discovery, and things become much more positive again. And that's just a little snippet of the arc of my story. But I've wanted you to spend some time with the arc of your story this morning as we're delving into worship and scripture together. Because our memories, our memories define us in very real ways, not just individual memories, but larger patterns of our memory, the kind of life mosaic that these individual memories form, the things we can't forget, the things we wish we could forget. All of it's in there together. In fact, Memory is the only reason why any of us recognize that we have a life that extends beyond this moment in time. St. Augustine describes memory as the thread, the thread that binds our lives together, like the hem of a garment. And it not only binds our individual life together, but it binds our life to other people's lives. I mean, that's what distinguishes friends and family from other folks in the crowd, right? We share a common pool of memory based on a set of shared experiences. And the closer you come to know someone, the more things you share. That's why reminiscing about the good old days brings us such joy. 
as we're tapping into this pool of happy memory. That's why we tend to gravitate to people of similar age, because we share a baseline of life experience, of life memory, whether we know each other individually or not. I mean, my fellow Gen Xers, we, we watched the same cartoons growing up, we read the same books, we saw the same movies. Most of us had a crush on Winona Ryder at one point and had an early career goal of being a Jedi Knight. Those things bind us together. And the binding thread of memory is also what can make growing old lonely and isolating. When we start to lose our peers, those who share our pool of memories, it's like losing part of yourself. And it's what makes diseases like dementia and Alzheimer's so devastating. They fray the thread. They unravel the hem of a life. And all this holds true not just for us as individuals, but as institutions and even nations. Cultures and societies have collective memories that define them, that shape them. And God's people are no exception. Memory matters. And it's why one of God's most often repeated instructions for us, for all of God's people, is to remember. Remember the Lord your God is one. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Remember you were once slaves in Egypt. In the words of Psalm 105 that was read today, remember the wonderful works the Lord has done. Remember the Lord's miracles. Remember the judgments the Lord has uttered. Because it's through this intentional act of remembering that we come to know and understand who God is and thus who we are because of who God is. It's how we're reminded of who God is and who we are in God, lest we become forgetful, or more accurately, when we become forgetful. And that's why it's so important for us to be here together in this space, doing what we're doing together this morning, to worship together, to study together, to pray together, to hear again, to retell again, to continue to absorb these promises and these proclamations of God. Because that's how we find and then regain our feet. It's how we get and then recover our bearings. That's why when we are seeking Christ and seeking the kingdom of heaven, we have to look backward regularly. We have to look backward. We have to probe our collective spiritual memory, and that is what we have within the texts of Scripture. The Bible is the record of God's revelation to humanity. It's the record of the collective memory of God's people as they have received this God, interacted with this God. And specifically, Scripture preserves for us the promises and pronouncements of God that are given to us to be the wellsprings of our hope and our faith and the blueprint for our work and our life together as God's people, as the church, as the body of Christ. It's there for us. It's been given to us to return to time again, to jog our memories, both when we're feeling like we're wandering in the wilderness, but also when we feel like we're soaring on eagle's wings. We have to remain grounded in the promises and the proclamations of God because that's where our identity lies, in the nature of who God is. That's where we discover who we truly are. 
In the words of the prophet Isaiah, listen to me, you that pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you were carved and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father. Look to Sarah who bore you. For Abraham was one when I called him, but I blessed him and I made him many. The stories, the memories surrounding Abraham, the blessing of Abraham, the transformation of Abraham, not only tell us who Abraham is, but they reveal to us who God is. And the same is true for the stories surrounding Isaac and Jacob and Moses and Joshua and Ruth and David and Esther and on and on and on. Scripture is the record of what God has done with and for and among God's people. And because of what the Lord has done, we can trust in what the the Lord has promised to do. Because after Isaiah reminds us to look to Abraham, to look to Sarah... The prophet continues this way, for the Lord will will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her wasted places. He will make her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. We can trust God to transform us because God has transformed Abraham. Because this is a God whose deliverance is never-ending, whose salvation is forever. And therefore, we can take hope and we can take courage now in the present because of what God has done in the past and promised in the past. It's a process for spiritual healing and recovery. And it's a process that perhaps may not be illustrated any better than in Lamentations chapter 3. Did you catch that that beautiful passage that we read for our call to worship was from the book of Lamentations? This passage that was part of the inspiration for the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, that we sung? It comes from the book of Lamentations, which, just as the name implies, is a book filled with cries to God, the pouring out of grief because of pain and suffering and injustice. But in pouring all that out to God, the writer of these words experiences some transformation. This is some of what was written before Before this hopeful passage, it says, I am a man who's seen affliction by the rod of the Lord's wrath. He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness rather than light. Indeed, he has turned his hand against me again and again all day long. He has walled me in so I cannot escape. He has weighed me down with chains. Even though I cry out for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has barred my way with blocks of stone. He has made my paths crooked. I have become the laughingstock of all my people. They mock me in song all day long. He has filled me with bitter herbs and given me gall to drink. And so I say my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness. I well remember them. And my soul is downcast within me. But then he writes, But this I call to mind, this I remember, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never comes to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O Lord. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope 
in him. That's how remembering this process of probing our collective memory of, as the people of God It's how it helps us to find and regain our feet, to find and regain our bearings. And it's a process not just for times of struggle, for times of darkness. It's also a time, it's also for times of success when things seem to be going very well. Remember, the Lord says, remember you were once slaves in the land of Egypt. And the only reason you're not still there is because the Lord God rescued you and delivered you and set you free. So, don't think that all this subsequent life and success that you have found is all you're doing. Don't let your head get too big and treat the poor, the marginalized, the stranger. Treat them well because that was once you. You were once slaves in the land of Egypt. In fact, there's a passage in Exodus chapter 10 where the Lord says to Moses, as Moses is going to Pharaoh and and asking Pharaoh to let the Lord's people go, and as the plagues are pouring down and as the battle ensues, The Lord says to Moses, go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his officials in order that I may show these signs of mine among them and that you may tell your children and grandchildren how I have made fools of the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them so that you, so that you, Moses, and your children and grandchildren may know that I am. Am the Lord. We are to remember, we are to tell the stories, to remember who God is and remember who we are. But it's about a lot more than just knowing the past, not just recalling these stories. It's about bringing the past, these promises. These proclamations, it's about bringing them from the past forward into the present. Think about the festivals and the high holy days that the Lord instructed the Israelites to observe. Festivals like the festival of booths, where they would reenact their time in the wilderness as they remembered the story. The festival of unleavened bread, the festival of Passover, all of, these, all of these ceremonies, all of these holy days were instituted not just so that God's people would remember, but would reenact the past so that the past would become part of their present, so the story of their ancestors would become part of their story. Because this God we worship isn't just the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. The Lord our God is our God. The God of you and me, of all creation. This God is a living God, not just a past God. And the meal that we are going to reenact in just a few moments is in the same vein. Jesus instructing us as his people to do this in remembrance of me. Remember me. Remember who I am. Remember who you are in me. Remember all that I have done. But do that by reenacting this meal that I am having with my disciples. To not just know that I am the bread of life. To not just know that the cup of my blood is the cup of salvation, but to eat it, to drink it, to take it into you so that you might be transformed more fully into my people in your day, in your time, for your day and for your time. As we are knit together as the very body of Christ in this place. 
And so as we prepare to come to the table this morning, let us remember, let us eat, let us drink, and let us do so together. Because this table is where the thread of the gospel story continues. It's where the thread of the collective memory and hope of God's people, how it becomes sown into our lives and how our lives become sown in it, that we might remember and that we might be fed and nourished for the mission, the ministry, the calling that Jesus proclaimed in the past, but is for uh, for us today. Thanks be to God for the invitation to join him at this table. Amen.